Hi everyone, my name is Owen Magab Inawa and welcome to HYVA. What we do here is show entrepreneurs how to focus on their income producing activities by showing them how to work with virtual assistants. But in addition to that, one of the things I do is I go out there looking for successful entrepreneurs to come on the blog to share with us stories that I think we can take and implement in our business because, you know, being an entrepreneur is already a lonely process and the more I can provide you with entrepreneurs that you can learn from, we help to build the community. And so, Today, my guest is Chrysia from WomenEntrepreneurHQ.com. And Chrysia has a, you know, a wonderful story. You know, she got into business and as a result of the business, she got into debt. But instead of giving up, she continued, you know, kept on making the changes that she needed and was able to get out of debt as a result of her business. So I'm trying to find out how exactly, because a lot of entrepreneurs listening to this might be in the same situation. So Chrysia, let's get started. You know, introduce yourself to the community and we take it from there. Well, Owen, thank you so much for having me on your show, and thank you so much for introducing me to your community. Uh, well, yes, well, I actually have a back-to-back -back story of debt, so uh, this would, should be really interesting. But uh, right now, my focus um, is my online show called Women Entrepreneurs HQ, and that came about uh, the fact that I was able to two of my online magazines in May. So after that, I was able to focus my attention on this and just grow it so I'm pretty excited that's awesome that's awesome so let's get started what exactly I mean, because the whole idea of this uh, interview is really you got into debt as a result of your business and how, steps you took to get out of it so take yeah. me back way back when when did this start you know this whole entrepreneurship journey and how did you get a result into debt as a result of it I guess well I went to business school and in since I think I was 15, I was in, in uh, private Catholic school, and the nuns asked me, what do you want to do when you, you grow up? And I said, I want to be a businesswoman. I've always wanted to be a businesswoman. I'm not going to reveal my age, but uh, for me, uh, the uh, influential factor was Charlie's Angels. Uh, I found that those, li okay, I know they're not businesswomen, but at a time for me as a child, I thought they were, they were independent, they were traveling from one place to another, saving the world, and I thought, I want to be a businesswoman. So I went to university, and at university, that was one of my goals. I met my uh, boyfriend who became my husband, and he also wanted to be an entrepreneur. But he comes from a culture where entrepreneur is not always, entrepreneurship is not always, um, it's not easy. He, he's uh, from Paris, and, you know, the French, they go to work, they go to school, they go to work. There's sort of that hierarchy and entrepreneurs. It's not as um, popular as it is in North America. We always had that desire to uh, to have our own business. So one day we, we realized, oh, African Americans were really into the whole um, African fabric culture. They were wearing their African prints, and we thought, wow, you know, maybe we can do that. We're going to import stuff from Africa, and we're going to have them sewn. We're going to have beautiful robes, and we're going to have tons of little things for kids, and we're going to sell that. Now, I just want to say that this is before the days of eBay, and this is before the days of the Internet. So just to put things into perspective. So my husband uh, went to uh, Ivory Coast, and um, he found people there who could sew uh, uh, sew clothing for us. He found beautiful local fabrics and we started. We said, that's what we're going to do. We're going to do import and export. So we started getting all these stuff sewn and they were shipped to us. And at the time we were living in Vancouver, Canada. So everything was shipped to us by boat to Vancouver, Canada. And we were, we had a warehouse in Canada and we ha had a warehouse and, and just so that in we the have US. context as to like how much this is costing you. If you can throw in the numbers as you know, as you're going, it gives the, the audience an okay. idea of how much this whole thing is costing you at this point. Well, I, I don't remember all the numbers when it comes to building that business, but I do remember the debt at the end. <laughs> <laughs> uh, but the numbers were, were, I mean, you could just imagine Ivory Coast um, and Vancouver. This is before the Internet. This is before a lot of this new technology. Just having shipments on a boat, it was ridiculous. And then we had a warehouse in Canada, and we had a warehouse in the U.S. And we had a car because we had to drive from Canada to the U.S., but we had jobs at the time, so that's what and one of the things I want to say. We both had our full-time jobs, and we we're doing this on, uh, sort of on the side. So we were investing pretty much any money we had outside of paying for the basic necessities in this business. So at the end, we did get a beautiful catalog together. So this is uh, what it looked like. It was just a very small catalog. I created this on my computer, uh, on in Word, and then I had it printed, and uh, we started. Uh, 
again, again, before the internet, before eBay. So we had to get this to an audience. So what we did is we bought a list of, um, of females in America, African Americans, from a list broker. So we had to pay for that. Again, don't remember all the numbers, but I know it, 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 nothing was cheap at the time. <laughs> and we had to mail because no one So we, we mailed, we physically mailed these in to the, through the mail to different addresses. And, and this was several thousands of dollars. Did you and mail it from... Canada to the U.S. or was it international no. mail at that point? We, we were driving to the U.S. because we actually had um, a facility at Blaine, New York. And I remember there was a post office. So we would drive down to Blaine and we would mail from there because that would already cut the cost of, of mailing. Obviously, we had to drive and put gas in the car and drive to the U.S., but we still had to go to the U.S. anyways. So we mailed all of these catalogs and we thought, well, this is phenomenal. We're just going to wait. Orders are going to pour in. Woohoo! And our dream of um, building uh, libraries in, in, our, in Ivory Coast, everything was going to happen, no problem. So we did mail, and we waited, and we waited, and we waited some more. <laughs> and then we got a few sales, and we, oh my God, the first few sales we celebrated, we were so excited. But then we're like, okay. And, and then how we were you handling, because this was the day before internet, like the way it is now, how were you handling the sales, the few ones that came in at that time? Well, they would, they would come to, again, our facility in Blaine, so we would actually get the order, we would fulfill the order, and we would go to the post office, and we would ship it. So it was a fairly long process. By the time they sent us their order, we processed it with the credit card and whatnot, and then we shipped it back. But then we realized, wow, we're not getting as many orders as we thought. So we thought, okay, we're going to go to the people. So we started doing research to find fairs. So we went to fairs in Washington State, in Oregon. We were just driving down and going to fairs. And we were talking morning to night. It was hot. And we still were, and people were able to touch the fabric and see what the artisans in Africa had created. But we were still not able to get that many sales. So we tried, we tried to figure out tons of different ways. Then we thought, okay. We're going to go back to Canada. Maybe we're going to try to find our market in Canada. So we went to tons of trade shows. We had to pay for the trade show, pay for the booth, get the booth decorated. We had trade shows where we'd go, and, and barely anybody came to our booth. And we were honestly, at, at a certain point, we were just discouraged. I think it was, um, and I'm trying to see, it was a, a, at least three years we had this. And after a while, we were like, okay, we have sunk too much money in. We, we, we can no longer sunk, sink any more money. So even though we had full-time jobs and we were putting money into the business, we still got into a, a lot of debt. I, I believe the debt was close to $20,000 uh, by the time we were done. But again, you have to remember, we both had full-time jobs and every every penny we had was going to that business. So that business in the end would have easily cost us around $50,000 just to operate. And we we didn't we did not recuperate anything close to that. So basically and, there was loss as a, as a result of it oh, of $20,000, but there was still money that was going out of your pocket for from your full-time oh, yeah. job that you don't even know how much that was so oh absolutely no because we were we were we determined to do this to bring this to light but after a while we were like okay we really have to look at the numbers and we really have to be honest with ourselves so it was really too hard uh, i was too hard broken by the whole experience um and having all of these beautiful artifacts just sitting in our warehouses and i couldn't throw them out I, and, and i couldn't burn them so what I decided to do is I did some research and I found um, a local shelter in Vancouver that took in women and their babies. And I thought, well, at least there are kids that are going to be able to have the backpacks. We had little elephants. I don't know if anybody can see that. We had little stuffed Bring elephants. Bring me close with to the camera a little bit. Oh. Bring me close to the camera. We yes. had, yeah. There you go. Good, good. See it. Yeah. Oh, there the little elephant there. Yeah. So we had those, and um, we had tons of little backpacks and, and, and cosmetic bags, and we thought, okay, you know what? At least somebody out there will be able to benefit from it. So I packed everything in my car, in the trunk of my car, and I did two or three trips, and I gave everything up, and we decided afterwards to move to Toronto, and I remember going to the bank and getting the bank manager to help with a reconciliation loan, and reconciliated everything. Thing and I, we, I think we took a loan, a uh, reconciliation loan. I think it was for five years, and, and what was that loan we paid it off. The loan was supposed to do what? It was supposed to uh, all of the because we had the money. The money we owed for um, the business was on different credit cards and line of credits. So we went to one bank and we got everything reconciliated okay. under one roof, so that it would be one payment. And instead of paying it in on, in three years, we had it paid off in one year. 
because we were we didn't want to have that on our back so that was the uh, end of uh, that first uh, experience and then a few years later oh, let me okay, we're gonna that, though, uh, because you said mm -hmm. you're going to go ahead and get another loan to cover all the different loans that were in different chunks right so you put them under one bucket but that new loan now has not gone right it, it, it's still it's still going through your story that new loan the consolidation loan is still there right no, the conciliation loan that we got, it was a term of five years okay. to pay it off. Okay. So it was outstanding and for five in one years. year. Yeah, no, but we paid it off in one year. How exactly do you do that? Uh, basically, we, we lived on one salary. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, the, was, any money that was coming Toronto, in from the other job was going into paying yeah, this first that, loan. Right. Directly. Okay. So we paid the debt off in one year. And and when we realized that we were able to live off of one salary, and we were living very comfortably, both of us had uh, good salaries in, in we're working in corporate uh, Canada, we realized, oh, well, this is going to continue. So after that experience, we kept working and living off of one salary, and we saved the whole entirety of the other salary since we were able to do it, and it really didn't change our and feel that it changed our life. I, I, I think we're having Skype issues. Uh, let's see if we can have okay. Skype catch up. Can you hear me now? Yes, I can. Okay, so just to back up a little bit, the initial uh, loan from all the different cards, whatever, turned out to be 20000 and then you got another loan, uh, which was to consolidate everything, to pay it off uh, in five years. But then what you did at this point now was because you had two salaries, you now brought it down to, okay, let's, let's, let's leave on one salary, and every money that's made on this other salary, we're going to apply it to uh, the consolidation loan of twenty thousand dollars, and instead of five exactly. years, you ended up getting a, a paid off in one year. So exactly. continue with the story at this point, because you realize that you can live on one salary. Continue with yes. the story. We basically decided to continue living on one salary, and it shocked a lot of people when they found out. Some of our friends, they were like, "How do you do it?" It's like, "Well, we're doing very fine because you know we we did it, and we did we we did it by necessity at first because we really didn't want to carry that monkey on our back, but then we realized." We still go on vacation. We still go out to great restaurants. We still buy whatever it is that we like buying because he lo loves to shop as well in terms of clothing. So it really didn't make any difference to us. But we thought, well, if we could pay off a loan in a one year and live one on salary, that means that now this money we could use to save. And that's what we did. And so Where? moving forward, uh, I'm assuming there was, uh, a, as you said, there was two sides to the story of getting in debt. So there was another uh, part of the story, again, where you accrued another debt as a result of business. I want yes. to dive into that as well, too. So okay. go ahead. Well, as I said, both of us are, are entrepreneurs. So even though we were working in corporate and we were making great salaries and saving one, one, one salary and living off the other, we still had the entrepreneurial itch. And that started itching a few years afterwards. And uh, at the time, this was an idea my ex-husband had. And as I said, he's uh, from Paris. So... In French, the French are very into food. It's very important for them. So I know that for me, grocery shopping was a hunt. I had to go find the right croissants for him, the right French bread, the right cheese, because you know he, you know, he just didn't eat anything that came out of the grocery store. And in our search, we realized that there were a lot of people coming from France and, and people from uh, Francophiles, who, so Anglophones who love the French culture and lo love French food. And you also had people from Quebec. Moving to Toronto and not knowing where to shop, because it's not like in Paris where you can go anywhere and find any type of ingredients. Here, certain ingredients were located in certain shops. So he said, hey, we should do a food guide. And I thought, a food guide? He said, yeah, we should do a food guide. Said, That's a great idea. We're going to do a food guide. We have all this audience. They've come here. They don't know where to go. We're going to sell to them. So we thought, okay, let's do a food guide. So our first food guide, uh, it's called the French Shine of Toronto, and it looks like this. This, again, was somebody who worked with me in a corporate who created this, a little dark. Uh, inside, everything was laid out on my computer, yeah. very, very, you know, on my Word document. So we created this, we did this, we paid for the cover. It wasn't too much because it was a friend who was doing it. And we didn't pay for the layout because I did it myself. And the printing, I can't remember how much it was. I think it was a couple thousand dollars. But we only had 500 that we printed at first. And he had a, a great network uh, in the French community, so we sold that to the French community. We went to the co French consulate, to all the French sort of uh, meeting places. And the first edition, we all, we sold, I think out of the 500, we must have sold 400 and something copies. So we were, we made a little bit of money. It was really great. So afterwards, I got divorced, <laughs> and uh, I kept uh, the business, and I kept running with it. And I thought, okay, well, I want to do a 
a second print, but I think I really want to take it to the next uh, level. So I hired a graphic. I don't know if this is too personal to ask, but as a result of this story, talking about debt, was was the reason? Uh, did this after the divorce had anything to do with the debt, or this was a no. separate? Okay, go ahead. No, okay. no, no, no. Not at all, not at all. Um, so for the second uh, print run, I decided to go higher end. I had a friend who was a, a fairly uh, high-end creative director for a lot of the top uh, advertising agencies. And she said, you know what? what? The first print that you did, great, you did it yourself. You, you had great success, but it's really now time to go to the next level. So uh, she helped with the layout, and I hired her. And this is the second edition. This is what it looks like. So it looks very, very professional. I've actually yeah. seen other books who didn't look this great. And inside, it was really well laid out. And, of course, I, I printed more. I went with 5,000 edition cop, uh, printed. And the price of the book went up. But to help finance all of this, I started selling ads. So I basically would knock on doors. I literally knocked on doors. And I started selling ads to different advertisers to help cover the cost. Now, it did cover some of the cost, but it didn't cover all of the cost, and the printing cost was horrendous. I mean, my bill for printing was, I believe, $15,000. That was just the printing. Wow. And then I had to pay for the layout. I had to pay for editors, English editing, French editing. I had to pay for storage, because I'm not storing this, these in my home. 5,000 books, you're not used to. So you have to print to pay for a storage facility. And then every time I need to order books, either for myself or for a store, I have to pay the shipping costs from this, the facility and the transportation costs. So, so the handling and then the shipping. And um, I didn't realize all these things going into it. So what I did for this book here to get the word out is I hired a publicist. So you have to pay the publicist. Additional cost, now, yes. It, which costs, again, you know, most, most publicists charge about $4,000. And so for, that we're keeping track, the, 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 just the printing alone already is $15,000. And this was financed just, how? Was it by credit or? Uh, line of credit. Okay. Line of credit. I, I self-financed this. It was my line of credit. Um, so um, with the publicist, I was able to get a lot of um, the word out, sort of the, like the, the, sort of the that boss. viral. It really worked. Um, I was able to get a lot of stores calling me saying, or they were emailing me because I had a website, and they said, listen, you know, we have clients coming in, they want your book, can we carry it? So it was great. I got a lot of exposure. I was on the front cover of a, the national newspaper here in the lifestyle section. I was on TV. I was on radio. So there was a lot of movement happening, but I wasn't selling enough to cover all of these costs. So... In hindsight, why? Why was that, though? Um, I, you know what? I, I don't know because I was in all of the big stores. I was in smaller stores. I was in some shops that were listed in the book. Um, I think the costs were high because I was printing for only 5,000 um, copies. Um, you know what? Honestly, I don't know because I actually had hired a consultant, a publishing consultant, so somebody who had been in the publishing industry for years on end, and he helped me, helped me with the numbers, break down the numbers. We knew how much everything cost because I'm right brain, so I kind of yeah, well I think it cost this much. I heard no, he was left brain, so he had everything mapped out so that you know I would tr keep track track of my costs, and it's surely not a lack of knocking on doors and telling people about it. I mean, I was going to events selling it. I was going to evening celebrations with books selling them. So it's definitely not a lack of trying. Yeah. Um, yeah. But I still made the decision with my uh, publishing consultant to go with Outwitter Edition. Well, I've been listening for, for the first year to second um, year. Skype, Skype needs to catch up. Sometimes when we're talking you know, fast Skype, you know, can you hear me clearly now? I can hear you clearly, oh, yes. Go ahead with the story. Sorry, go ahead. No problem. Well, with my uh, publishing consultant, we decided to go with a third edition. So, again, hired the same team. I hired the graphic designer. I printed and everything in the last edition, which was this one here. And she redid the cover. So, again, I had to pay for that. Um, pay for storage, another $15,000 in printing costs. And this time around, I didn't hire um, this sort of the third time around, I did not hire the publicist, uh, but everybody else was involved, the translator, the graphic designer, everybody was involved. And again, I, I sold well, I, you know, a lot of momentum, but again, not enough. And, and still this time around, I went and I got some ads. 
I hadn't increased my prices on the ads, and the ads were very well priced, um, but it was still not enough. And after a while, I thought, okay, I'm going to go knock on the government's door. So I went to the tourism office. I went to tons of different governmental bodies to try to get some help or to try to get some loans or financing. And my project didn't qualify because here, there, if you are, if you have something in in French or in 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 French or bilingual, then you can get some grants. But my project did not qualify because of the fact that it wasn't a literary piece of it was commercial. So I couldn't get any help at all. And after a while, I was sinking. I mean, I was sinking. I I, I wasn't sleeping. My anxiety level was woo, <laughs> and, and, and uh, I looked at my numbers, and I was eighty thousand dollars in debt. I had actually I forgot to mention I had kept taken a loan out from the um, there's a a business bank here that loans to small businesses, so I got a loan out there. So I was eighty thousand dollars in debt, and I thought I can't continue this. I mean, I I just cannot. I'm 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 gonna die. I just can't handle all the stress. And a lot of people were very heartbroken that the book wasn't being published. You go, oh my God, it's such a great book. It's phenomenal. It's amazing. I love this. And these are, some, in many cases, French people who are very tough when it comes to their food. They're very, they're critics. And I said, I'm sorry, but I'm the only one supporting this. Nobody else is helping me. I've knocked on every door. And if I continue, I'm going to get to a point of no return. So I stopped. And what I did is I started working on contracts. I, I was working pretty much, you know, morning, night, and day to pay pay off the debt, which is what I did. Um, I worked and I paid it off. <laughs> How exactly did you do that though? Because if we leave it just by saying that, you know, we don't hit the nail well, on the head. Because okay. the thing is, you're already in debt. There's this whole emotional thing that's going on. Oh, what, yeah. You know, trying to think, why did I even get into this debt for this business that's not being profitable the way it was? And But yet you still have that drive to continue. And I want to figure out what kept you going and how did you do it? What kept me going printing or what kept me going after the debt? What kept you going after you know, after the debt that has amounted to 80000 at this point? What kept you going on it, feeling that you, can, you, you, could, you could get past this? And how did you do it too? That's the second question. Honestly, I don't know if I took a lot of time to think about it at the time. And I think if I had, perhaps it would have paralyzed me. Um, <laughs> I... You know, I knew that I had, nobody else was going to pay for, for the debt. I had to go out and pay for it myself. Now, I have to say that I, I, I was lucky in the sense that I was an affiliate manager. So that means that online, when there are those big promotions, the big Jeff, Jeff Walker promotion, I'm the person who puts marketers together. So I had uh, a contract that allowed me to get sometimes like large windfalls of money at a time. So that definitely really helped in allowing me to pay my debt, debt off in, in about, I think it, it took me about three years to pay it off. So basically um, what you're saying is that even though you had this debt from this other business, you still had, I mean, being an affiliate manager in, 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 in a sense, it's still some form of a, a business that you had, a side business that you had, you still yeah. went out there to, to try and still earn a living from somewhere else so that you could pay off what you're obligated to. Absolutely. Absolutely. And uh, I was still paying the debt when I launched my first magazine. Earlier, I said that I sold two magazine in May. The first magazine I, I launched in 2007 online. And I was still very much in debt at that time. Um, and I just kept going. I, I guess to your question, I, I don't think, I think honestly, if I had thought about it more than that, I most likely would have been paralyzed. But I kept just kept plowing through, just kept moving forward. Um, and so I did pay off the debt. It was in 2009. It was fully paid off. And then I launched my, my two online, uh, I sold my two online magazines uh, a couple months ago. And so that, that, that brings us to the, the online magazine right now. That's the Women and Pinot HQ, right? The, the two that I sold? No. The one that I have right now, you mean? The new platform that I have right oh, now? Oh, yes. yes. I'm trying to continue the story. It's not from... Oh, okay. The two, ma the two magazines that I had, one was on health and one was on beauty. Okay. Okay. And yeah. so it, it was you. You published some new content, in, but in a different uh, niche, and sold it the same way as you sold the the books. In a, yeah, a, a little bit in the same uh, sort of concept. I was writing reviews, and uh, I started doing a lot of affiliate marketing on there. So I was selling other people's content on on those sites, and those sites were generating uh, full, the rev the equivalent of full time revenues. So that was really great. Awesome, awesome. And so, I mean, for me, I'm, I'm really trying to, you know, f you know, figure out, is there a framework? Because a lot of entrepreneurs will get to this point where some business will, you know, cause them to be in debt. 
and instead of you know it, it might be they'll be all so overwhelmed feeling why am i still questioning the fact of why they're still in this business or not but somehow you figured out a way out of it so i mean help us dig dig deep and figure help us because i want to see if there's kind of like a framework that one can create to use to be able to you know, to, to deal with this issue because a lot of entrepreneurs are going through that yes uh, and and i wish that uh, i could say yeah i had a framework but I, again as i said earlier in this conversation i'm a let i'm a right brainer so i'm a creative person so i just do it and then it's a question of me figuring out how to get systems in place to or remembering how i i, I did it uh, for me, yeah, the debt was definitely present because I know because I was getting my statement every month. But I, I, what I did is I decided to ignore um, the fear. I, def- I was feeling the fear, but I definitely decided to ignore the fear and not let it stop me. Because it was basically at that point in time I could have given up and gone and, and gotten a job in the corporate world and paid off the debt and then kept moving in the corporate world. But my desire had always been to be a successful entrepreneur. And it didn't work at that time. It hadn't worked, should I say, the way I wanted it to work financially. But I wasn't willing to give up. And I think that, for me, that's, that's the only thing that's kept me going, is that I wasn't willing to give up. I've never been willing to give up. Wow. I, I like that because, uh, you know, is the thing is the fear can be paralyzing, you know, especially when you take away from that perspective. But you see, you're saying in your point, you, you, you decided not to pay attention to the fear. But some people might, and it might yeah. become a, a thing where you know they, they have to now rationalize. It, 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 from your own experience, is there some kind of tactics that you use to kind of block that fear from your mind? I'm trying to truly really try and see if we can dig out some things that we can share with the audience, I guess. Well, for me, I, I kept taking action. When I, I, the business weren't providing enough revenues, that's why I said, okay, I have to go out and get some contracts. So I got some contracts. And I was working long hours, and I, I did do things that other people might not be willing to do. Working, like what? Working long hours, working weekends. Um, you know, sometimes friends would invite me to events, and I said, I, I can't go because I have to work, or I have a commitment, or something of that nature. Um, you know, when it's beautiful, we, we here in, in Canada, we have winter and we have summer. So when it's beautiful in summer, I, I'm more of a summer person, winter is not my favorite season, it's great to be outside. Well, it's beautiful, it's 30 degrees or 34 degrees, so it's what's uh, equivalent to in America to 90 degrees or something of that nature. Well, I'm in working. I'm looking at my computer screen and I'm working. So there are certain sacrifices that I made the decision to make um, in order to keep moving. I, I'm already digging out two things. There is, don't pay, uh, don't don't let the fear paralyze you. Be willing to make a sacrifice. Those were two things that are, are key in, in the whole process of really trying to get, you know, dig your way out of debt. And so, moving forward with the story, you finally end up, you know, getting out of debt. So, yeah. and, and, and you now decide to create the magazines, and also as a result, earn income uh, from affiliate reviews. Bring us to where you are right now in regards to uh, your your current uh, venture. Well, you know, where I'm at right now with my current venture, um, uh, as I said, you know, after selling the two online magazines in May, that uh, allowed me to have more time. Um, And also, I had started, it was in March. Um, The current project that I have right now, actually, I I actually will have to talk about that because we're talking about failure and and, and taking risks. Uh, There's a product launch that I launched earlier this year. And it didn't quite go the way I expected it to. and again, I spent time and money, not as much as before, because again, at this point in time, I had learned, but it didn't quite work the way I expected it to. So in my desire well, What to, did you learn? Because you said that you, you said something I think is key for us to share. What did you learn that made you... Not, you did something different, I guess, to yeah. reduce the debt, but what, what was that that you learned, I guess? Well, a couple of things. First off, um, um, I, I changed... There was a webmaster that I had. I changed a, a webmaster. Um, the webmaster I have right now, his costs, his fees are, are lower. Uh, when it came to the graphic, I also was very careful uh, to keep the cost of the graphic work at a reasonable price. Um, I had somebody review all of my copy, but this was not a, a, a you know an editor. Like This was somebody who, you know, she was doing her PhD, she was very good with copy. You know, this was not somebody charging, you know, thirty, forty dollars an hour. So there are a number of things that I did to reduce my risk, my exposure to risk with this project. And at a certain point I realized that it was definitely not going to take on the way I expected it to. So in my desire to try to find a way to market this, 
I used a tactic that uh, a very successful internet marketer had given me in December, and I used sort of the framework, and I adapted it, and I changed it a little bit, and um, uh, Owen, I'm not sure if it's possible for us to pause this interview or not, uh, because my battery is running low, and my cord is not attached to my laptop. Oh, oh so you have to uh, attach the cord? I have to go run and get cord yeah, or else go ahead, uh, go it's going to shut down. This is real life interview. Sometimes it happens. Just this go is, ahead. I have, I have, I throw it. Go ahead. Okay, I'll be back in two. And we're waiting for her to come back uh, for, you know, to get the cord so you can plug it in before the computer laptop gets turned off. But this will be edited. Magic of the editing will put the pieces together. Wow, you're back. That was fast, so maybe we might not have to edit anything. So go ahead. <laughs> go ahead. So, um, as I said, this very uh, successful internet marketer who made millions online, uh, and the reason I know him is, again, as an affiliate manager, I had the mobile phones, the personal contact information of a lot of these big marketers. And I said, I called him, and I said, you know what, I heard of this strategy that you recommend, and I was wondering how it worked, and his recommendation was, I go out and I find 10 very successful women online, and I interview them, and I ask them to promote my product, and they're promoting everybody else's product. But the experience I had had contacting different marketers, I thought it might be a little bit of a difficult game. You know, people aren't willing just to mail for you just because you ask them to. And I started looking online, and I found two other guys. Uh, one is David Seitman Garland, and awesome, his show yeah. is uh, The Rise to the Top. And the other gentleman is Andrew Warner, and his show is Mixergy.com. And I think you've been on Mixergy.com. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Andrew Warner, I know him, yeah. Andrew, and I'm, I'll be interviewing both of them on my show. And I was looking at what they did, and I found their website, and I spent hours watching their videos, their interviews, and reading their background, and I thought, okay, this idea that um, this very successful marketer gave me, and what these guys are doing, hmm, and I thought, well, these guys, they do have women on their shows, but a lot of them are interviewing, you know, young men who've made millions upon millions uh, with internet startups, and I thought, well, nobody's really focusing on women and women entrepreneurs because we have a different way of approaching business. Um, and actually, one of the guests that I interviewed on my show was Dr. Sharon Hadari, who had worked in America. She's a scholar, and she's worked in America. She launched one of the um, organizations dedicated to women and helping the advancement of women in business, their own business. And she's found that most women have that ceiling of $1 million. It seems that we are adverse to risks, and women, we're really into sharing our stories. And I thought, well, I'm going to use my experience, because I failed, I've had, and I talk about it, I was, you know, too many failures to talk about on this stage. <laughs> and I've had ups, and I've had downs, and I've had mentors, and I decided to use the example of these two guys, so David and, and Andrew, and the example, and create Women Entrepreneurs HQ. And that was going to be a platform for women to come and share their story. So what you're doing here is very, very close to what I'm doing. But I'm really trying to focus on women so that women can see themselves and say, wow, okay, this woman sold her house. She sold the shares in her company. She was willing to move into a one-bedroom apartment to live out her dream of building her successful business. If she can do it, then that gives me courage. And, and that's where I'm at today with the Women Entrepreneurs HQ. So the journey continues, and, and what, what I like about it is that, you know, you shared the story, the, the way you bought the African attire and material and tried to sell, that got you into debt, you found, you know, went to a situation where you ended up, instead of spending two incomes, you only, you know, had one income and saved the other one to pay off the first debt. Now, what you know, found the, 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 the zeal and the drive to continue, even with the, the initial setback, to go into another business, got into the, the book, uh, uh, what's it called, the... the actually created a book that was reviewing food uh, food products and all that and that got you to a, a larger debt which was ended up being eighty thousand dollars 
still got the drive, paid it off, you know, made the sacrifice. First of all, not not paying attention to fear and not you know uh, and making the necessary sacrifice, ended up paying it off, and now you're in, moving into a whole new story, which is the Women Entrepreneur HQ, and that to me was what I wanted to show to entrepreneurs who are listening to this is that you know you, you don't give up you, you continuously do what you got to do and you know you get to that point where you're dead free yourself too and you know what Owen to your uh, to your point uh, I'm, I, I can well, hear you I think, uh, we had this, this, and were we, you afraid we had a slight sorry? delay uh, I'm trying to catch up yeah. what was the point you just made I said that uh, everybody that I interview on my show, and I do, you know, interview some men as well, men or women, I don't care who you are, I always ask, what about failure and what about fear? Because all of these people who achieve great amounts of success, they've dealt with failure and they've dealt with fear, but everybody tells me that they keep going. And it's sometimes very scary, but they keep going. And they're... Um, answers and their journey and their experience bring a lot of courage to me because I'm starting again from scratch you know this is again yet another journey for me and some days I sit here and I'm like <sighs> and some days I'll, I'll go to David's website or I'll go to um, Andrew's website and I'll see Andrew 585 interviews okay uh, David 300 something interviews and I'm like hmm I don't have that kind of experience but you know, there's something that'll happen. I'll, I'll hear a comment from somebody who, like a woman who, who has a seven-figure business, and she'll say something. I like. I watch some of your interviews, and I think they're very insightful. I think what you're doing is very important for women, and that'll get me charged up, and that'll keep me keep going and keep focusing on that as opposed to. Ah. Definitely, yeah. I mean, and the good thing about it is that with the internet now. You know, I was having an interview with another person the other day, another entrepreneur, how, you know, we're talking about how being lonely the whole life of being an entrepreneur. But now with the internet, you don't have to feel that lonely. You you, you can even have people who are, as mentors who don't even know they're your mentors by listening to, you know, shows like Andrew Warner's show. Or even your show, ladies who want to, you know, you know, connect with other entrepreneurs can listen to them and be able to you know, learn from them and have them as them as mentors without them even knowing. And even if you want to take it to the next step, Contact them. The internet, Twitter, Facebook. People are now so accessible. It's, it's it's ridiculous. Absolutely, I couldn't agree with you more. I mean, Andrew Warner. When I contacted him to be on the show, I was a little nervous. I thought he's gonna go. Who is this person? <laughs> and he was so generous with his time. Um, and one of the in women that I interviewed uh, not long ago, her name is uh, Nancy D. Solomon. I actually literally tracked her down. And she couldn't believe that I had tracked her down. And when I explained the story about Han Andrew, of how he's been helping me and how amazing he is, and I, you know, this is a guy, by the way, who had business a business that was producing thirty million dollars a year. So this is like a guy is really good in business. And she said that what I was doing was I was networking up, which is something a lot of women don't do. Women network in their comfort zone. So if they're at a certain level, they'll network with women at the, at the same level. Whereas guys are much more comfortable networking up. And she was saying that more women needed to feel comfortable networking up in order to, you know, to grow. Because obviously... I have to... Uh, can you hear me? Because we have a little Skype delay. ...has an insight that's a little different from somebody who's built a build business at 100,000... Can you okay. hear me? Because we had a, a delay in Skype. Can you hear me now? I can hear you perfectly. Please, I want you to make that point again because sometimes Skype delays and I don't want you to, uh, to, 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 to for the audience not to hear the point you just made. The last point you just made. Repeat it, please. No problem. Um, I had said that um, I, I don't know how far people, what people heard, but let me start from, from the about beginning. The I said that about how women have to network up, I guess. Yes, exactly. When I went... And I, I, I contacted Andrew Warner's. I, Andrew Warner, I was networking up because I was starting uh, my show. He had already uh, easily three or four years of experience on me. And I could have thought, well, he's never going to give me the light of day or time of day because who am I? I'm just starting. And he was very generous with his time. And uh, a business coach that I interviewed, Nancy D. Solomon, uh, she's out of uh, Seattle, and I tracked her down as well. When I told that story, she said, what you're doing is you're networking up. Men have no problems networking up. 
women do women tend to network at their own level so if they're you know earning about thirty thousand dollars with their business they're going to network with other people at that level if they're you know at a hundred they'll network with people at that level but she said that how you grow exponentially is when you network up because obviously somebody who's built a 30 million dollar a year business has different insight from somebody who's building a fifty thousand dollar a year business wow i like that and, and so that we can you know put the interview all together you know the initial focus was you know how about you know entrepreneurs who are in debt because of their business what they got to do to keep on going so they can get out of debt by still being in business, and that doesn't necessarily be the same business, but it could be some other business. What is that one thing in this very uh, topic so far that you feel that you know we've not been able to you know uh, touch that you want to just you know share as the last point before we end the interview with uh, anybody who's facing the situation? I guess. Well, I, I think that we've we've touched upon you know er everything that I would have liked to be able to communicate, but I think that what I'd like to do is honor you for talking about failure and talking about how it shapes the uh, our journey as entrepreneurs. Um, it's something that very, I'm very passionate about simply because based on my experience, but also the fact that oftentimes it almost seems that people who are successful, they're successful overnight. You know, they wake up and now they're, they're running a $20 million a year company and you wonder, well, you know, was there failure? Were they afraid, afraid of anything? How did they do it? Were there, you know, any lessons that they learned? And we, we almost sanitize it to the point where it's like reality TV. It's a marriage of, of reality. And being an entrepreneur is, is, can be a lonely journey, especially when you don't know who, who to go and, and, and tap in, which networks to tap into. And the reality is when you start talking to successful entrepreneurs, I can, I bet you, literally, I bet you a billion dollars that you will not find one successful entrepreneur who's not dealt with fear, who's not dealt with sev several failures and kept going on. And, and the fact that people understand that when you're going to be an entrepreneur, it means that you're going to take le higher level of risks. And when you take risks, some of it pays off and some of it becomes a lesson. <laughs> so, uh, and, and that's just the way it is. Wow, I like it. It's, it's, it's a great way to end it. Just be realizing of the fact that that's what's going to happen. It's how you deal with it when it happens. That's what matters. And now, Christian, how's, how best can anyone who's been listening so far, how best can they get a hold of you is what I'm trying to say. Well, they can definitely get a hold of me. And I think you're going to have the link uh, to the online show. And that's womenentrepreneurshq.com. It's way easier to read it because nobody can spell the word entrepreneur. Uh, it's like, <laughs> is there an e, an R, how many E, is how many R? Um, I'm also on Facebook and Twitter. And if they spell my name, Kretzia, I'm Kretzia Miss K. And there's only one of me. So you'll be easily be able to find me both on Facebook and on Twitter. I appreciate your time. I, I really like the fact you did this interview. You know, come on here and talk about a topic that some people might not be comfortable talking about. And I appreciate I appreciate that. Thank you very much, Christian, for doing the interview. Thanks. Well, thank you so much, Owen, for having me on your show. And we're done. Welcome back. I hope you enjoyed today's interview. And before you go, I want you to do me a favor. I'm trying to build my community of entrepreneurs who find my content useful on Facebook so we can engage, you know, have discussions live right there on Facebook. And to get to my page on Facebook, you go to www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. And again, it's www.com. What am I saying? No, it's www.facebook.com forward slash H-Y-V-A-S-S-I-S-T-A-N-T. And when you get there, what you're going to do is look for the uh, a button that says like, and you click on that button, and then basically you uh, become a, a fan of the page. It's that simple. You don't even have to leave me your email. Just click on the button that says like. And again, the page to go to is www.facebook.com forward slash h-y-v-a-s-s-i-s-t-a-n-t and that stands for hive assistance real easy i look forward to seeing you on facebook have a great day